If I would have been more careful with my diet, if I would have done this, if I would have done that, I could have, I could have avoided this, <laughs> right? Which is really not, I, you know, who knows, right? We just don't know. Exactly. Um, and he said to me at the time, um, he said, Joe, like when you fall into a pit of quicksand, the last thing you should be doing is trying to worry about what got you there. You want to be thinking about how to get out. Hey everyone, Yelis here. Welcome to another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I'm the host and as well a uh, cardiac arrest survivor. Now on this podcast, I chat with fellow cardiac arrest survivors in the hopes of providing emotional support to anyone listening, especially other cardiac arrest survivors. As you might know, this uh, is not an easy journey. Uh, it certainly hasn't been uh, for me and still isn't for me, uh, nor has it been for our guests in this episode. In this episode, I had the uh, pleasure of talking to Joe Fisher, a psychologist and, as you might guess, a cardiac arrest survivor. Now, the story of Joe's cardiac arrests, I will let him tell you in the interview. But what I will say, however, is that this episode can be a very insightful one when it comes to dealing with all these emotions that surviving a cardiac arrest and living with it can entail, uh, as Joe also delves into a range of practical exercises, tapping into his expertise as a psychologist. He also talks about the mechanisms the body goes through when suffering the kind of trauma uh, we both went through, and if you're a cardiac arrest survivor yourself, that you went through. In short, we cover a lot of fascinating topics in this conversation, which I truly hope you can benefit from. Joe also mentions a lot of great resources, which you can find all linked up in the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode. Now, if for some reason you can't find the link to the show notes there, you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Joe. With that, I hope you will find much help and meaning in this conversation between me and fellow cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior, Joe Fisher. Joe, a uh, warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I really appreciate it that you took the time to do this. Likewise. You know, I appreciate your doing this. You know, the reason I decided to do this, I watched Jamie's podcast. Uh, which I heard mm. Jamie's uh, interview. Which, yeah, the first, think, uh, yeah. first one, right? Yep. And I was watching that one night. I was up at my mom's house, and uh, I thought, you know what? I need to do that. I've been through something like that. I want to. Mm -hmm. I want to. I want to be part of that. It's important, and I think what you're doing is yeah. important. Uh, you know, then I've seen a number of the other interviews you did, and um, some of these people are just fierce. They're really, they take, takes a lot of courage and, yeah. um, you know, just kind of move forward from something like this. So mm. that's why I wanted to be part of your podcast. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure. Yeah. So, um, let's start where it all started for you. You know, this journey, like when did you had your cardiac arrest, how did this, yeah, how, where, uh, who saved you also and yeah. uh, how did you survive it? Well, I want to I want to start actually 30 years ago. My my dad okay. actually had a cardiac arrest when I was 24 and it's something that has been something I've experienced in my own family life. Uh, mm. my family has there are five there are five of us. I have five siblings and my mom. And when my father dropped you know, dropped dead from his cardiac arrest, it was absolutely devastating to all of us. So I was well aware before this happened to me uh, how devastating cardiac arrest could be um, in terms of, you know, just, you know, how devastating it could be. Um, I had taken a lot of precautions, been very careful in terms of my, you know, I was exercising a lot when it happened. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I think I was in really fairly good shape that year. I had had a, I had a couple of open water swims, um, one with my, my sister, three miles. 
just like a you know an hour hour and a half swim, an hour and a half to two hour swim. Um, so I had pretty good endurance, and the morning it, the morning of the event, I had actually gone swimming. Um, at that point, I had been preparing to go on a trip to Tokyo with my oldest daughter, and I had studied a Japanese lesson that morning. Uh, after that lesson, I uh, got in my car, drove over to the Croc Center, which is where I swim or, or swam at that point, um, and got in the pool to do my two and a half, my two and a half kilometers. So, in terms of the event itself, um, I did the. I remember. How, how old were you? How old were you then? I was fifty-three. Fifty-three. Yeah. Fifty-three. Yeah. I'm fifty-seven now. Hmm. Um, yeah. So. That morning I got in the pool and swimming is like meditation. I love it. Swimming along, it's very relaxing. And for whatever reason, I decided or thought it's time to get out of the pool. So I finished that, you know, kind of swimming away from where I had gotten in, came back in the direction I had swam from. And I did not have, I would love to say I had some kind of symptom that would have cued me into Mm. You know, you're about to have a sudden cardiac event, but I had absolutely nothing. Um, you know, I had been maybe a little bit more fatigued over the, the prior year, but other than that, you know, none of this shooting pain down your left arm or you know, jaw pain, none of, none of these, these different symptoms you expect to have with a heart attack or some kind of cardiac event. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that morning I got to the edge of the pool and I remembered thinking I could drop to the bottom. It was eight feet down from that point. Um, or I can just kind of flop out onto the deck and get to my feet. So, yellow it was a flop out kind of morning. <laughs> right? <laughs> so Sometimes flopped, you have those. <laughs> yeah. I flopped onto the deck. I remember I stood up. I remember looking down at the block, the starting block on the side of the pool. And um, that point blacked out. Um, I remember wow. I was calm. All I saw was, it was just black. Uh -huh. um, and it felt like a moment later, I woke up at the cardiac intensive care unit um, at my local hospital. I was, you know, at the time, at the time it was, so disoriented i was so disoriented i was like you know i had a, i had a tube coming out of my throat and i'm thinking hey w where's the pool <laughs> where'd the pool go um i i remember one of the nurses said you know you had mr fisher you had a heart attack you know then it was off to the races i started to think about my dad and the first, my first feeling was, oh my God, I, sur I somehow I survived it. <laughs> this thing that I had anticipated happening, somehow I survived it. Th through nothing I did on my own. It just, you know, our lives are just, you know, they turn on a dime and you happen to make a certain decision. Go to the bottom, flop out onto the deck and you have no idea how these things are going to impact the rest of your life. Wow. So, Crazy. Yeah. And who then, who was the person that uh, saved you? I was standing, <clears throat> when I stood up, there was a police officer. He was off duty, named CJ mm -hmm. Reyes. Mm -hmm. um, he saw me, he was about 20 feet away from me. I had, I had the opportunity to talk to him recently. Uh, he said when he saw me go down, he, he ran up and he knew I was going into cardiac arrest. You know, I had the, the I don't know what that, people use that, whatever your breath is. You know the name? <laughs> I don't remember the name offhand, but that you're gasping for your last breath. Uh, he said he observed that and he flipped me over and he, he said I went to work and he saved my life. This has been four years ago. Yes. Yeah. It's still very emotional to share this, right? Oh, absolutely. 
I live with it every day. Hmm. Uh, it's brought it's brought uh, a lot of suffering and misery misery to my life, but it's also brought a lot of blessing hmm. Hmm. and uh, gratitude. Uh, very lucky. Yeah, yeah. I, but then, uh, like you said, yeah. at the other side, you do have the suffering. That, yeah, that makes it all very difficult and very emotional to each time yeah. talk about again. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times, um, <clears throat> for me, the analogy I immediately kind of grabbed on was that it was like being hit by a freight train. Yeah, uh, I was totally in the flow of my life when it happened. You know, I was planning a trip overseas with my daughter. I was, yeah. you know, I... I love my job, mm. uh, plugged in with my family life. I've got three kids, wife. I had a family and a life that I, I had spent 53 years building. <laughs> and yeah. This thing hit me like a freight train. Yeah. Um, and it took with it not only the possibility of taking away my life, but the quality of my life. Uh, I think cardiac arrest can turn you into a ghost. Um, For sure. And I'll explain more what I mean by that as we continue. But but um, mm -hmm. it is a devastating, devastating event for anyone to go through. Yep, yep. And um, wait, so because your your dad, he did die from a cardiac arrest. So is there like heart disease? Like, is there like issues that are yeah. in the family or... Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of like I don't have an ICD. You don't. And I don't. No. And after my father, ah. my father's um, cardiac arrest. My father died in 1991, so it was yeah. really kind of the stone ages of all this. Yeah. yeah and yeah. we we were left. My family was left really with not a whole lot more information that his cholesterol was a little high. Um, we didn't know whether he had an electrical problem. We thought it was an electrical problem that he had because when they did the autopsy on his body, uh, he had maybe one or two blockages. Um, okay. Yep. Mm. He, you know, so we thought it was probably an electrical issue, but we didn't really know. Mm. Um, I had been checked out by a cardiologist about, it was about six years prior to the event. And given the AOK, -okay, all, all systems go, you're going to be fine. And I just, for me, it was just kind of a matter of let's keep exercising and moving forward. Sure. Yeah. You know, but I, but now I think the main driver is cardiovascular disease. Um, we have, you know, or I have a couple of uh, genetic things that are fairly common actually in the population, which is why a lot of people die of uh, cardiac uh, coronary artery disease, but I have, you know, I had, have, have had somewhat elevated lip A and, um, you get small particle size of your L, um, LDL. So some, some kind of funky stuff going on with my cholesterol, uh, that over time coupled with, you know, kind of like, a, you know, I had a decent diet, but it wasn't a great diet, but coupled with that it was lethal. Hmm. And so that's why they think that you did have a cardiac arrest now because of your yeah, cholesterol. They, yeah, they determined that the, the morning after I was informed that I had, uh, I had um, multivessel heart disease um, and that I would need a cabbage, a coronary okay. artery bypass grafting. Yeah. Um, I was told I would need a quadruple bypass. Um, but when they went in and they did the operation, it turned out to be five. Five. So <laughs> what I was told afterward, I actually studied Latin in college and I had never heard the word, but I thought, would that be a quintuple? And he said, yeah, that's right. Quintuple. So, <laughs> so that's what happened. I had a quintuple. Hmm. But you didn't get an ICD. No. What, what, what is the reason for that, actually? 
Um, I, you know, I don't know totally the reason other than to say that I think that they determined that the um, electrical activity in my heart was normal. Um, mm. They didn't see any pri like primary driver. Mm. Um, they didn't see a primary driver with that. Uh, and, and, okay, so just out of out of curiosity, then, like, what are the 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 things that they recommended you to do? Like, change your diet a little bit, take medication, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I'm one. They, yeah. I think basically the standard thing you get here in the U.S. is change your diet. Yeah. Um, take your medicine, which typically uh -huh. are statins. I'm on. Yeah. I'm on. Um, in addition to statins, I'm on a. Um, um, PCSK9 inhibitor, um, which is another, some, they have some new medications coming out for cholesterol, uh, that I'm fortunate to, to be on one of those, um, exercise. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, my HDLs were also a little bit on the low side, not to get too deep into the weeds with this, but I always ran with kind of low HDLs. So it's important to kind of regularly Act, being active is very important. Regular activity, lots of veg. Um, you know, so I'm pretty strict on my diet. Yeah, for sure. Now, after something like that happened, right? Yeah, you're. <laughs> it's, it's an inspiration. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your life depends on it. Yeah. So yes, yeah. So how did the recovery went for you? after you know that happened that event well, recovery was very very difficult it got yeah. very very complicated and i think part of the reason was i i kind of fell into two camps you have the kind of sudden cardiac arrest camp but i was also in the you know kind of coronary bypass camp and the coronary the cabbage camp that group a lot of it is um a lot of people don't, you know, qualify for a cabbage by dropping dead first. Um, it's a very, very, very stressful operation. But I think I had another layer on that because I had actually gone into cardiac arrest before, before it happened. So when, the, you know, the operation went fine, um, but you're, you, you know, I felt, I don't know how people feel about it, but I felt like they had cut me apart. You know, you feel like a lobster where they kind of like chop up right up your, the center of your body. And I had no, I kind of knew what they did to me, what they had to do, yeah. do to me, um, to, to basically save me. Um, but there's a very visceral part of it, um, that I had an expectation. I think that, okay, well, Finally, I'm out of the hospital and I'm going to heal. I'm going to be fine. Mm. And then <laughs> I was on the one night I was on the sofa. I'm going to tell a few of these little stories. One night I was on the sofa. I'm laying watching the show with my son. You know, I forget what show it was. And I'm laying there and I, as I'm laying there watching, I felt my heart flip in my chest and it mm. felt like, and then I had this sensation of, of, I don't know if it just gave a strong beat or what it did, but I had this sensation of boom, into my head. So it was not only, it was not only kind of like a, a flutter, but it affected like a bigger part of my physiology. And then it's off to the races in terms of like, what the hell was that? And, you know, I think it's a pretty human thing to do. You start wondering. Of course. Um, unless you've been on yeah. the receiving end of them. I mean, I think when you read it in a textbook, you sort of like, oh, you know, a lot of people have different kinds of things happen <laughs> with a cabbage, right? Or with this kind of thing. But when you're on the receiving end of it happening and you realize there's no out of your mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. and you don't feel safe mm -hmm. in your own body then it's nothing but abject terror. Then you get scared. 
you know, especially, you know, after it's like, oh my God, I survived. Did I? I'm not so sure anymore. So after that happened... Um, and that was in the first year, I guess? That's in the first maybe two or three months. So yeah. Mm -hmm. First couple of months, I think. Then not long after that, I had a... I was laying in bed and I was half uh, kind of awake, half asleep. And I felt like I was going to get shocked again by the AED, um, which I've never heard anybody describe that. I'm not sure how, how it would have been possible, but I felt here it's going to, I'm about to get shocked again. And then okay. I, I literally in the bed, I jolted up. And I don't know if it was like a PTSD thing I was experiencing. Right, your body responding. Yeah, I think that our body, from the past. you know, I think our bodies encode, learn yeah. information in all kind of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that my body somehow stored that information in it. And it came back a little bit later, <laughs> you know. Um, then the next thing that happened was I just, I went back to work too early. And I don't remember at this uh, point how many, too, too what, early. What is early? Well, I think I was about eight weeks out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Might've uh -huh. been, might've been 10 weeks out, but it was uh -huh. early. It wasn't, I was, I went back too early and it was really me. My boss was very supportive. I think it would have been, I, I don't think, I know it would have been possible to take more time out. But, you know, like you're taught, you got to get back on the horse, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, well, let me get back on the horse. <laughs> you know? So I got back on the horse. I went back into work and I was doing things that, that were at that point secondhand to me. You know, I'm a psychologist mm -hmm. and I was interviewing people. I was working with people in super, like students in supervision. A lot of the just stuff that just, for me at that point in my life, it just was very, very, I know how to do, you know, yeah. and felt very capable of doing. Uh -huh. And one day I was doing, I was at my desk and I remember I took a call and my heart started to race. It would just go. Mm -hmm. So I had this, another symptom. It was like, what? Like what, what's going on with that? You know? And that happened another, that happened a couple more times. Um, it led to a couple of visits to the emergency room uh, wow. for them to check out, like, is something going on or not? Hmm. Uh, it's, it's, I think, notoriously difficult to tease apart uh, cardiac problems from um, what your mind does what your nervous mm. system does in reaction. You know, it's a whole system problem. Um, yeah. So it's very, very difficult, I think, to really tease them apart. So I started to have uh, physical sensations that would best be described as an elephant standing on my chest, uh, which I, of course, you know, if you said to somebody or you heard somebody say they feel an elephant standing on their chest, you're going to think they're having a heart attack. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. to me was an absolute physical sensation that I struggled mm -hmm. with for a long time. For a long time. For a long time. Thank God. Okay. You know, I could have it checked out, you know, because I think you always have to get these things medically checked out and I could yeah. work through it. Um, but it's something that I really struggled with. How up until, you know, when it happens up until now, like... Yeah, how were the other years of recovery? Like, how was the last year? I, I've gotten much, you know, over time, I've gotten much, much better. Um, yeah. I think what happened um, the last year has been the best. I think every, you know, my, my cardiologist who did, he's just a fantastic, fantastic mm. guy. Um, he said, the further you get away from it, the better it gets. Yeah, that's yeah. what for with everyone who we've been talking to here on the podcast has been saying that too, that it does get better as time progresses. You have to allow for the time to pass, and it sucks because the time is 
You know, for me, it yeah. did anyway. I mean, there may be there's some people that, you know, it's like the fantasy you see on television. You know, they do a few cardiac CPR, they get up, let me have the tiramisu. Yeah. Let me go on. <laughs> yeah. That was great. It's like in the movies, right? Let me go but back uh, to my in life, reality, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I never understand in, in American culture anyway. It's kind of the thing you can poke fun at. You know, we have this this uh, sudden cardiac arrests and heart disease, I think, kill half the people in the country. It's like the leading yeah, cause yeah, yeah. of death. And we feel comfortable joking about it here, <laughs> which for me is kind of like a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, <laughs> but it is what it is, right? You know, I, I wanted to say, you know, a couple more things that I experienced, Yellis, that had to really work their way out of my system were I got hypersensitive to sounds and I was hyper sensitive to temperature and at okay, different points in it i remember i would be in a room and um i could tell when the temperature went up two or three degrees i was so tuned into that my nervous mm -hmm. system was and those things just took took time I, I did a lot of things to work it out but it took it took a it felt it took a long time <laughs> to weed it out of my system. Can you give some examples of things that you tried or did? I think it was it was the July after it happened. It happened in March, the very beginning of that July. I actually yeah. connected to a therapist who, a very, very talented trauma therapist. Mm. And I did a course of EMDR, um, mm -hmm. which is an acronym. I, I should know what that stands for. So I, I muscle desensitization or something, but it's basically... Yeah, yeah, eye movement desensitization. I, there you go. Yeah. B basically, it's a method a method of uh, kind of reintegrating disparate parts mm -hmm. of the of your brain. It uh, yeah. gets separated because of a trauma. So we did a course of that, or I did a course of that, which was just phenomenal. Mm. And I also did, I did a lot of, she was actually very skilled in polyvagal theory. Um, so I was doing a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of exercises that were developed by a woman named Deb Dana, uh, who is okay. phenomenal, you know, just has done some phenomenal work in the area of trauma. And what did she do? Poly polyvagal theory. What is that? Well, the, the nervous system, right? When you're, you're, you study psychology, right? Ellis? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you have the sympathetic nervous system. And you mm -hmm. learn you have, there's you have the parasympathetic nervous mm -hmm. system. Polyvagal theory basically, and it's a proven theory, but we basically have more branches to our nervous system than that. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So another one is called the dorsal vagal. And you have the, um, um, the vasal, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the ventral, the ventral mm -hmm. and the, the, the dorsal. And then you have the sympathetic. So when you feel calm, relaxed, connected, you are in a ventral state, which is mm -hmm. one part of the nervous system that basically helps us to make connections with people that, that we don't share with, for example, an alligator or a reptile. These other parts of our nervous system are much more, they predate all of that. Yeah. And they're much more primitive, but they're there to keep us safe. So... You know, one thing I really did was learn a lot about kind of what was happening with my nervous system because I had situations where I had, I had one situation, for example, where I had gone in to get medications with my wife, uh, yeah. a local, like kind of a local supermarket. And um, I, re I remember I went up to the, I was standing at like the vitamins and I literally froze. I was so... You know, my, mm. my, I just froze up and I couldn't move. So, you know, I think in hindsight, what was happening in that situation was my, my autonomic nervous system, it, you know, all of our nervous systems, they scan 24 seven. They're always kind of taking a look into the environment to see what's safe, what's not safe. Um, they're looking for cues that are external cues that are internal. And I had up to that point had a few massive internal cues that I was not safe. Okay. Mm. So in that situation, I had some heart movement. I was standing there. 
and I was like a deer in the headlights. I'm not mm. going to move because I was so, I was, you know, that, 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 that dorsal system kicked in so strong that it, it will, it will freeze you up just like a deer in the headlights or just like, you know, like playing, we have an expression here, playing possum. Um, yeah. You, you, you have, I don't know if you have that one in Belgium. Well, but not, no, <laughs> you don't. Okay. Maybe. No. Yeah. But I, I think I could sort of, uh, see what it would mean. Yeah. It's like, you know, you know, there's if different types of animals will freeze up. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, I used to be out in the woods, right. And I would pick up like a wood toad. Yeah. I don't know if you have those either, but when I would pick it up, the thing would just be like, and it would freeze up. Yeah. And basically what was happening is I was kicking off its nervous system and it was as a defense, as a safety measure, it was freezing up because that's what we do. You know, that's what those animals do, but we, we share part of that system with them. Uh, we of course are more able than that, but that's part of, part of us. Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been and, well, still is in many ways. To show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs and if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug. Or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right. Thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. Could you recommend any cardiac arrest survivor to do trauma work, to go to a trauma therapist and do EMDR or any, any other kind of work around trauma? Uh, you know, I think I'd keep it. I, 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 you know, I think that trauma therapies are very, very important. Um, yeah. if you are able to, um, you know, but I, I want to say, I think any way that you can reconnect is important um, because when you um, when your nervous system reacts to these kinds of cues of danger, being connected is the important, you know, just important to reconnect with people. So I absolutely recommend, you know, people get therapy or find someone to talk to. Um, yeah. That's a big part, I think, of of healing. Otherwise, you're, yeah, you know, you're going nuts. You're not going nuts, just the way we're built. Yeah, it's too bad that they don't sort of directly offer that to us, like therapy, or at least here in Belgium, it's just like, yeah, go uh, outside again and and live your life again. Yeah, yeah, but not really taking into account, like, oh yeah, what emotionally happened maybe to that person. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> you know? Is it the same in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that, that you know, th there's a lot of good work going on in the U.S., but you have to find it. Yeah. There's a lot of good things happening with, you know, I think Deb Dana's work. Uh, there's a, there's another thing called acceptance commitment therapy. Oh, yeah. yeah. You've yeah. heard of that. Yeah. I've done a lot of that. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think anything. Yeah, acts. 
acceptance and commitment therapy. Yes. Yeah, I, I think you know another another thing you experience is you you, you can get very fused into your thinking. Hmm. So how do you mean? So what I mean is you 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 you, you know when you're in these different um, states, mm -hmm. like when you're very very frightened. Um, your nervous system, it's going to come, your thinking is going to be shaped by that. And you're going to have thoughts of, I'm in danger. I'm not going to survive. This will, here's a classic. This will never end. Um, my life will never get better. And all these things are coming out of that state you're in. They're not coming out of the totality of who you are as a person. They're just yeah. coming out of that state your nervous system is in. It's, is in. it's speaking for you. Right. So, okay. you know, one of the things I did with ACT was we started, um, they have something in ACT called thought diffusion, mm -hmm. right? So I would take these thoughts um, and I would write them on cards. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Right. So instead of this being in my head, I get it out onto a card as a way to separate myself from it. Kind of the total, you keep them with total you? person I am. Yeah, I carry them mm -hmm. around. So okay. I'll share this with you, Yellis. Yeah, classic. Cool. This is for when I was driving. I won't get there safely. I won't have the energy. I'll die on the way. That kind of thought that, you know, that kind of thing is very, very destructive. If you make it or have it, just let it become part of the totality of who you are. It's a part of one part of the way we operate. It's not the total part. And uh, why do you keep them with you? Uh, you know, I, I, I used to refer to the cards often. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. as much anymore. But they're a reminder. <laughs> yeah. They're a reminder to me of how, you know, the kind of, you know, kind of what I had been through. Mm, I see. Um, yeah. So, you know, they're part of me now. So I keep them, I carry them around. And how do you feel today, actually? Today, I feel pretty good. Yeah, you know, I'm not. Yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't say that I'm totally, totally done. Um, where I want to be, you know, I still, you know, still like I. A lot of things have really resolved. I don't have any issues with temperature or sensitivity, sensitivity to sound. Um, you know, I think in a lot of ways, you know, I don't feel. Um, yeah, I'm pretty optimistic. Um, you know, I have, I have, um, I'm pretty optimistic and I'm hopeful. Um, yeah. you know, I feel good. I feel good in a way about, I think there was, I think it was, I learned a lot of important things through, hmm. I've, and along the way through this, although I wouldn't want to learn them again. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You don't want to go through it again. No, no, but I learned an awful no. lot. You know, in a lot of ways, you know, it was like running into quicksand, mm -hmm. the event itself. And, um, I, you know, the first thing, you know, what do you want to do when you get into quicksand? You want to crawl out. Well, you you yeah. want to get up and walk out. And I remember at the time it happened, I was, I was, uh, you know, I was just in misery. And I kept saying, I was like a broken record. And I'd say to my, I was saying to one of my brothers, God, if I if I would have been more careful with my diet, if I would have done this, if I would have done that, I could have I could have avoided this, <laughs> right? Which is really not I you know who knows right? We just don't know exactly. Um, and he said to me at the time, um, he said, Joe, like when you fall into a pit of quicksand, the last thing you should be doing is trying to worry about what got you there you want to be thinking about how to get out yeah yeah and he yeah. was he was he was dead on you know yeah. and i think you know in hindsight the way out was um and this is really an act metaphor but you have to lay down on it being vertical namely you have to do something that's counterintuitive mm -hmm. you know our intuition would say stand up and run the hell out but really what you have to do is accept that you're in that situation and kind of lay down on the surface of it 
and work your way yeah. up very, very slowly, one little bit at a time. It's hard, though. It's hell. Yeah. Hard as yeah, it's hard to do <laughs> it's, that it's, when you're in there. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's awful. Yeah, especially if you're doing it alone. If you're doing it alone, it's particularly difficult. You know, in a sense, it, you know, in a sense, yeah. I think that it. I think that's another piece, though, right? That that you know, one thing that I felt very intensely was I'm alone. I'm alone. This doesn't happen to anyone, which is such. It's you know that's. That was a part of me speaking right after the event, and I, I have a lot of compassion that I thought that. But, you know, the, the, the reality in my mind is that we, you know, all human beings suffer. My family's not yeah. the only one. I'm not the only one to have lost my father or have this kind of thing happen to me. Um, you know, which is, I think, one of, the, one of the things, one of the real pluses of this is it really wakes you up to that. You know, yeah. that we're not alone in our suffering. Even if you may be sitting alone or feel like you're alone, there are a lot of people going through the same thing or something similar to what you're experiencing. Yeah, you know? yeah, you're right. Um, and it does help then to hear two people, for example, right now talk to each other where this happened to. Yeah. If this happened to you as well right now, right? May uh, I uh, say something else? Yeah, of course. And another kind of a, a thought. One, another thing that I was doing a lot of was something called glimmers. Are you familiar glimmers. with those? Right now, it doesn't directly say something to me, actually, no. So, so when I was doing my, when, when I kind of was in the depths of it, and I was yeah. really activated in real misery um, in that hell we were just talking about, it was immeasurably useful for me to plug back in to times of my life when I was, um, you know, technically speaking in, in that ventral mode or that calm state, that connected state, that state when I felt able um, right. and I felt good. So I kept a journal and mm -hmm. in the journal I would do what, what Deb Dana called or glimmers where I would go through, I'd have a memory of when I was connected. Mm. Um, and, you know, for example, and I would go through it. We also called them SIFs where I would get a memory. I think about what was I feeling in my body mm -hmm. at that moment? What images do I have of the situation that I can kind of get back to? What was I feeling and what was I thinking against yeah. the acronym? So one of them, I won't go into it too deep, but was called Pterodactyl Girl, which yeah. was, it's a little story about when I picked up my oldest daughter. And um, it was my, she's, she's adopted, uh, adopted, adopted girl. And mm -hmm. it was just how we made that first connection, you know, but it was so key because you know i think the big lie when you get that deep into your misery mm -hmm. is that there's there's not there's there's not a break in the rain clouds yeah yeah where where there is but you yeah. have to hang on by your fingernails and this kind of thing i think helped me pull through that that's a great practice actually so you go back to a past event where you did feel something very positive in a way or something yeah. that you connected with in your body. That's right. Yeah. 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 I did a bunch of them. Um, you know, they also drive, you know, kind of, um, you know, appreciation, mm, connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, you know, we, we, we all live our lives and there are times everyone I think has felt connected at some point. It can be difficult yeah. to get there, mm -hmm. but it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, great, great practice actually that you just shared. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people listening who had a cardiac arrest, yeah, you should, you should give it a try. I think it's a good thing to try. Yeah. Um, 
you mentioned that like you jumped quite quickly into your work again like like about eight weeks right mm -hmm. once uh, after your cardiac arrest yeah um how did how did that go like how did your life change um after your cardiac arrest or what have been some like difficult changes after you survived um my it was difficult um because it took it took um time for me to develop confidence enough confidence in my body again yeah uh, to kind of really again, be at yeah. my job um yeah. you know i would love to say like hey like i'm all done Woo, i feel great now totally but yeah. you know you still deal with it you know i don't think you go through something like that and you're just kind of like hey business as usual yeah no <laughs> you know so i still feel it every day i think on the plus side it's definitely connected me more with, um, you know, with the clients I work with, mm -hmm. with, with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, In which way? Um, I had my event about a year before COVID hit. Yeah. And as the U.S. rolled into COVID, there was a lot of loss. And a lot of people were dying. Um, and it made it excruciatingly difficult to be in that. But I just feel like I was more connected in terms of what that meant. What it mm. would mean when someone lost someone. Yeah. Uh, just how painful that was for people. Um, you know, people... People, you know, I, I, uh, my father, my father passed 30 years ago and, um, <clears throat> people, they, they, um, I don't know how I want to say this, but they, they stay with us, you know, even after they're they gone. Do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can be damn sure my father would want me doing this, talking about mm. what happened to me. Yeah. And, you know, you know, and I know there are a lot of other people that, that have people they were connected to. They... You know, you know, so, you know, those people deserve more than to be, you know, kind of a punchline in a comedy, a sitcom. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And I don't, well, maybe I'm, I don't want to sound harsh, <laughs> but that's it. That's how you feel. Yeah. Like that, you know. Well, I'm very sure that your your dad will be very proud, actually, of you of like speaking out today about what has happened and trying to support other people as well with this. Yeah, I think that's true of everyone involved. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the 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 first responders. Yeah, you. Yeah, I don't know your family situation, but. I have no doubt, you know, the different people I've met in this, um, you know, we're, you know, you, you know, I thought, you know, not long after this, I thought, you know, and I saw your, not long after it happened to me, I was driving and I was feeling like shit when I was driving because I was all, my nervous system was all like, Ugh, like, you're not safe. Yeah. And I'm like, Hey, like I've driven like for like 30 years, I'm safe. Hey, you're not safe. You know, like, so there's these conflicting parts of what you're experiencing, you know? And I <clears throat> remember going around the corner of the, one of the parks near where I live. And I thought, <laughs> I am not going to let this thing put me into a box. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I've seen your, you know, you have these different videos and you're like, you're a younger man than me. So you're like scaling these walls, like you're like Spider-Man or something. 
<laughs> and up these walls yeah. and you've you know and i know that that you know you, you're not like uh you're not like your typical young guy crawling up a wall like you're a young guy <laughs> and i don't speak for you but i can bet you're a young guy that's thinking am i going to make it up this wall what's going to happen next like because because i just think for me there's such an awareness of of this present moment is what i have and i don't know what's coming after yeah you're right and I thought, you know what, I want to talk to you because I know you don't want to be put in a box. And I know exactly. Jamie, I know that guy doesn't want to be in a box or, or any of the other people you spoke to, Brooke or et cetera, et cetera. I just yeah. feel that way. But there are a lot of kind of boxes. And I think that what happens in our culture is there's this, you know, the physical box. So... Mm-hmm. I should go swim five kilometers again. You know, that's, that's a whole nother thing. You know what I mean? For me, the bigger issue is the psychological box. The cardiac, you know, cardiac issues, sudden cardiac death can put you into a, uh, it can put you into a box, a psychological box where you can't connect because you're so, so messed up um, mm-hmm. by how it affected you emotionally, but it makes it very, very difficult to be present um, or to make connections. And those are the kinds of things I think that are just so, so important. I think earlier on, I said it can make you into a ghost. And a yes. lot of people, I think, walk around. A lot of people, that's how they live their lives. They don't make connections with people. They're not able to because uh, they're not you know, able to bear the weight of whatever they're suffering through. And I, I get that, you know, God knows I've struggled different ways myself. Um, you know, but it's so, so worthwhile to be connected and to, to, to have these bonds with people and to not, but how do you get out of that box? Is it by connecting? You know, I think that, you know, some of the things that I've said already, yeah, yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. I had a couple other things I wanted to say. I have a, a kind of a quick story for you. I yeah, think a big okay. part of it is, you know, for me, I had to embrace the mystery, what I would call the mystery. And 30 years ago, a buddy, a buddy of mine, I think it was actually 40 years ago, or close to 40 years ago, a buddy of mine, and I went up to Canada <clears throat> And this was like a long road trip. Uh, I, th- I think it was at the time, it's faster now, but it was probably about 18 hours in the car. And we went on this long road trip up to this uh, area of Canada that was very, very remote. So, you know, we left, there was a village nearby, you know, the village had like maybe 20 or 30 people in it. And then it was like a two hour trip further north. I'm thinking you've been to places like this. I don't know for sure. I've been to Australia. Like uh, you do have like some very, very tiny villages and you're way or, or towns that you're like, yeah, only 50 people live here or something. <laughs> yeah. So I was out there. Yeah. And this was an area where it was, it was uh, a lot of pine trees and lakes and it was out there. And the, the, uh, stars at night are fantastic. And I thought at the time, God, wouldn't it be cool to get into a canoe and we'll row out onto the lake and just check it out, right? That would be very cool. Yeah, so it was probably 2, 3 in the morning by the time the moon went down. We wanted the moon to go down because then it's just starlight. Get out onto this lake and it's the Northern Lights, it's stars all above. And um, as the boat went through the water, the water was like glass. So the stars reflected up off the water and it felt like I was going through space Hmm. as this, this, this canoe went through the water. So it was just touched me very, very deeply. 
it was a very moving kind of an experience, right? And it was a very positive kind of an experience that I had. And I thought afterward, I'm a little bit of, I guess, kind of a geek. And I thought, God, I wonder how many stars I saw that night, you know? Yeah. And you can go online, you can read that. And it's, you know, with the naked eye, you might see maybe three, 4,000 stars. Uh-huh. So then I thought, I wonder how many stars there are, right? And, you know, so I read a little bit about physics. I don't know much, but I read a little bit. And there are like 70 billion trillion stars in the sky. They don't know exactly how many, but there are a lot, more than any of us can grasp, right? Yep. And every one of us, we just see the slightest, tediest little bit of what's out there, you know, our experiences are profound for sure, but they're the smallest little bit of, you know, kind of what's out there to see. Mm. And in a sense, we're on the same boat. You know, every one of us at some point is going to pass. Mm. Some of us, you know, for me, it'll be a second act, right? Right. Maybe. I don't know. Hopefully, maybe we'll place mm-hmm. on third act. I don't know, right? Um, but it's, it's you know, we have, I guess I want to say we have so much in common. And I just hope that this, that, and I think that this, what I've been through with this, I want to, I want to, um, hopefully, hopefully it makes me more compassionate and more connected with people. Mm. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. Sounds like an amazing day. It was. Or night. It really yeah. was. It really was. Uh, yeah. Well, I've not been to Canada yet, but at some point, uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope to be on a canoe there too. <laughs> yeah, it's a great. It's a, it was great. You know, we have, we, yeah. you know, we do what we can do, right? Yeah. Joe, is there actually anything like um, that you wished your cardiologist would have told you sooner? Uh, or something that you discovered now that you wished you actually discovered at the start of your cardiac arrest <clears throat> journey that you could share to listeners? <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer this question. I, I, I do have a couple things I would say, I think. I, I think the one yep. thing I would say is d- death by chocolate may be a real thing. Um, <laughs> you, <laughs> you may not understand what I mean, but I do think sugar is there's not a whole yeah. sugar getting some very bad press now. And I do think that, I do think that my diet had, my diet was actually pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. My diet wasn't fantastic. And I have the genes of somebody that has to have a fantastic diet to, to slow these things down. And not everybody's in my body. So, you know, I can't, I can't, you know, people have, you know, you know, people have to do all kinds of different things to kind of take care of their health. Uh Um, I, my cardiologist, I don't know that they could have told me a whole lot before that, that they, that I did, wasn't aware of other than, you know, things I hope will benefit my, my, my family, my kid, my son, my, you know, which is, you know, basically that there are things you can do and, um, you know, they're, you know, people, people are, uh, learning more and more every day about luckily lipids yeah. and, you know, even with, even with the ICD, I mean, that I was talking to my cardiologist about that and that used to just be, a just shock. Right. And now it kind of like moves people back into rhythm. Just, yeah. You just have to anticipate there's going to be advances and all this stuff. They've done. A, they've made a lot of advances in terms of of the whole lipid, the lipid thing, heart disease. You know, yeah. I wish I would have known all of that forty years ago, but you know, forty years ago, it's it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Nobody really yeah. can. In a way, too bad that science does need to take time to discover all those things, right? Well, it can be a little bit frustrating, <laughs> but that's how it works. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and it is what it is. I mean, you know, my, my yeah. uh, I talked about my brother, the sage, before, because mm-hmm. we him and I had this same conversation, and he said, you know, I said, God, I wish they would have known this, and then I could have had a better mm-hmm. diet, you know? And his comment yeah. was, well, you're lucky you weren't born 100 years ago, because 100 years ago, you just yeah, would have been course. dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I thought, yeah. yeah, you're right about that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> Uh, is there actually still anything today that you feel is um, difficult to communicate to the people around you about like what has happened to you? Well, I, yeah, I would say this. I mean, I think that, that in many ways, what I went through having a sudden cardiac arrest was like I died to the self I was before. So I crawled into the pool, a guy that was, that thought he would never die on a gut level. I yeah, just yeah, kind of yeah. keep my you know, mortality was something for someone else. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know, of course we all know it intellectually, but you know, there's a big difference again between, yeah. um, knowing you're going to die and, and thinking you're about to die. Yes. And I was a man, I wasn't scared to death. I was scared by death. Yeah. And death, you know, you, you know, it turned out that, that, um, I don't know how to say this exactly, but I, I think that, that in some ways there's, there's a guy named Franco Staseski who's worth check, checking out. He's a guy that did a lot of hospice work. Okay. And he makes a point <clears throat> that death is in some ways our best teacher. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we, I think in so many ways we can live kind of lives of distraction um, where we're just mm-hmm. distracted by things constantly. And death has a wonderful way of waking you the hell up. You realize right. this is a, um, this life is transitory, mm-hmm. impermanent, temporary. Mm-hmm. And my chance, your chance to make the connections we want to live the life we want is right now in this moment. Um, you know, yeah. so that, I guess that, that would capture it. Yeah. It can be a scary wake up call though, but a very beautiful at the same time. Well, that's a crazy way to put it, but you got it dead on. Yeah. (laughs) It really is. I mean, and in a way it's kind of a, it's, it's, uh, it's almost like a superpower. It's true, right? And it's hard to communicate that to someone who hasn't felt it yet, like really, uh, because you could read about it, right? It's like, oh, you're going to die at one, one day, but there's a huge different, like difference, like you said, between just intellectually knowing it and truly feeling it that it's going to happen at some point. Yeah. Hopefully kind of a way off. Cause when, of course, cause, right. Cause when you feel it's going to happen any minute, it's all another thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, Joe, I just have like one uh, last question for you, yeah. but uh, is there actually anything more, first of all, like of like any notes that you, that you, that you wrote down that you you want to share? Let me just end by saying this. This moment was brought to you by C.J. Reyes. C.J. Reyes? He's the guy that saved me. Ah, okay. You're right. Yeah, the police guy. Yes. You know? Yeah. And that we, we are, all of us, inextricably bound to each other. Yeah. You know? And you'd never know it, but... You know, so have you actually met up with him? I guess you you have. I've I've talked to him on the phone. I haven't met him face to face, so we're, okay. we've been we're we're kind of figuring out how to make that happen. But I'm sure he's a nice guy, great guy. Um, you know, his family has a lot to be proud of. Definitely. So let me just ask you then the 
just last question that I have for you. Is there any like last kind of best tip that you have for any survivor listening? Best tips? Um, yeah, any any last thing or any last words that you would like to share to a survivor listening right now? There's so much I could could say. You know, I think one thing is is um, you're not alone. There are a lot of people that go have gone through this. Mm-hmm. It takes it takes time. Yeah, build supports. Trust your instincts. Trust what's going on in your gut. When people tell you, you just don't think about that. You gotta, you gotta, you have to work it out on your own, or you gotta work it out. I don't want to say on your own, but you have to work it out. You know what it's going to mean. What it's going to mean in yeah. your life. Um, have a lot of patience with yourself, and 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 uh, from Deb Dana's perspective that I brought up earlier, make friends with your nervous system. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I mean, she's, really all, she's so right. I mean, you know, because we have all these parts of how we function that yeah. that um, are just survival m- mechanisms that are built into kind of the beauty of how we're constructed. And we, you know, the nervous system that made me feel like crap in that supermarket is probably the same part of my nervous system that said, Hey, get out of the pool. You know, you know, it's that intuitive kind of part of ourselves. It's like always trying to, to keep us safe. So, um, so those parts of ourselves have to be respected and honored as well. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah. And for, yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> And for everyone listening, the people that you mentioned, I will link them up in the show notes because I will also actually take a look at uh, at both of the people that you mentioned, like Deb Dana, uh, and you mentioned another person. Uh, Franco Staseski. Exactly. Franco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he's good. Uh, he's- well, yeah. well, Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to do this conversation. Uh Maybe in, in some months or in a couple of years, we, we could do another one to see how life has been and other things that you've learned about this journey. But yeah, um, right now, thank you for, for all the insights that you gave. Yeah, I'd enjoy that. And good luck with you. Thank you. All right. And that concludes this conversation with heart warrior and fellow cardiac arrest survivor, Joe Fisher. I hope you gained something from this conversation between me and Joe and that some of the exercises might be of use to you and help you to deal with your emotions going through this experience. Now in the show notes located in the description of this episode, you can find every resource Joe mentioned nicely linked up. So definitely take a look at them. If you can't find them that way, then you can also simply go to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Joe. With that, I hope to get the chance to welcome you again soon on another episode on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. Until then, this is Yelis Fass signing off. Before you go, i uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered, these t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior project which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.